Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, um, and uh, I just wanted to um, have a, have a uh, last look at this uh, paper that just came out yesterday called Interacting Tipping Elements Increase the Risk of Climate Domino Effects Under Global Warming. So you're all aware of the dominoes. You know, if you stack up a whole bunch of dominoes in a line, and you can even start with the very, very tiny ones and working up to larger and larger, larger ones. You know, if you tip over the small one, it tips over a slightly bigger one, a slightly bigger one, a slightly bigger one. And the whole thing tumbles like like a pack of cards, you know, just uh, like a paper house or something. It's just it's just unstable. So this domino effect is like a chain reaction or uh, another way to describe it is, is cascading tipping point. So I'm just going to continue off uh, looking at this uh, paper. Um, highly recommend that you uh, just uh, Google the title and and uh, have a look at it yourself. It's, it's open source. So I was talking about the connections. They, again, they, they just look at four main tipping points, disintegration of the Greenland ice sheet, Weakening of the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, uh, the, the ocean currents, the dieback of the Amazon rainforest, and the disintegration of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. And they look at the connections, they look at the time frames over which this would occur, and uh, they look at the sort of the, the strength of the, of, of the um, um, well, the temperature that would be required in order to initiate the the tipping and that's probably the most difficult thing and i talked about the bifurcation diagram where you go from a stable state to another stable state but this is this, you're going to a much higher temperature the next stable state for the planet would be a much much higher temperature and you can model the uh tipping elements here's your baseline to the transition and greenland probably goes first and then West Antarctica and AMOC and Amazon rainforest uh, hang in there longer according to this and I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, the way you model it is the uh, XI is the state of a certain tipping element, CI is a critical parameter and tau I is a typical tipping time scale and I will be one, two, three, four. One is the Greenland ice sheet, two is the West Antarctic ice sheet, three is AMOC, four is the Amazon rainforest. This of course should be extended to 20 or 30 and have all of the tipping points in, you know, so I, you know, hopefully that is done soon. And so the rate of change of the, of the, of the uh, element with time, there's a nonlinear factor, a linear factor, and then the uh, critical parameter here. And this is uh, if you treat each um, element separately, but then there's connections between the different tipping elements and you're looking to, when you're working out the cascading or, or domino effect. So you add this coupling term, which depends on, you know, coupling say between, the, between two of the four elements. So, you know, in this, in this case, you know, you don't have a D11 term, it's a one, you know, J is not equal to I. So that gives you the coupling between all of these guys. Um, and then you can uh, work out the math and try to figure out the strength of the interactions and, you know, run a model with all different <coughs> changes to these parameters and on, look at the ensemble, the overall ensemble of the whole model and try to determine some things. So let's, so, so basically, what are some of the connections? Well, the components, of course, are the AMOC, the Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, and the Amazon rainforest. And when you look at the connections between them, uh, the interactions, so for example, Greenland ice sheet. Greenland ice sheet melts back, produces a, a lot of fresh water that is light, floats on the surface of the Arctic, and that prevents some of the downwelling. So the AMOC actually slows down, is reduced, and can actually shut completely down. Okay, and if the AMOC shuts completely down, well, there's a lot less heat going up to the Arctic. So that could be a... Greenland might experience cooler temperatures. It would experience cooler temperatures if the AMOC shut down. Okay, so that would be a stabilizing type of effect. 
uh, you know, the West Antarctic ice sheet. Okay, um, it's a bit unclear whether increased ice loss from the West Antarctic ice sheet would have a stabilizing or destabilizing effect on the AMOC. Okay, there's a number of different things that could happen. So if the if Antarctic was to get cooler, then there'd be um, less. Uh, okay, so well, the, there's an effect on deep water. Okay, so if there was um, an increase in the North Atlantic deep water formation is observed in response to a decrease in Antarctic bottom water production due to the release of fresh water in the Southern Ocean. Okay, so if there's more melt water in the Southern Ocean, then that will decrease the, the downwelling, okay, in, in Antarctica. So there's less Antarctic bottom water. So then the, it's seen that there's more North Atlantic deep water. Okay, so this is like a bipolar ocean seesaw effect. There's a salinity uh, effect. And there's also, you know, if the uh, Antarctic was getting colder, that would increase the temperature gradient to the equator. And that would strengthen the Southern Hemisphere winds. And if you have stronger winds, then that will um, that can uh, change the deep water uh, volumes, and that can then feed back and affect the the northern hemisphere. So there's all of those effects, but it's a bit more murky as to which ones dominate. You know, if the AMOC reduces or shut down, shuts down, then there's more warm water near the equator. There's more warm water going down to Antarctica. So that would increase the West Antarctic ice sheet melt. Um, Greenland ice sheet and West Antarctic ice sheet are, of course, connected via sea level. So if we get lots of melt from Greenland, raising sea level, that will raise the glaciers on, in, on um, that will raise the ice sheets in West Antarctic and East Antarctic, and that will increase the melting. And that happens the other way around. If, if Antarctica ice sheets start to melt first, raising sea level, then the Greenland ice sheets will also melt. And it's not just the melting of the ice. When the ice, for example, off Greenland melts, the gravitational pull on the water decreases, so the water tends to move away from Greenland, raising sea level, and that same effect is happening with West Antarctic. When the ice melts off of the land, land, of course, is pushed down by the ice. And as the ice melts and the water drains off the continent, Greenland actually will rebound and rise up. And that pushes the water away, raising sea level. And the same thing with the West Antarctic ice sheet. So there's these other effects. So there's the gravitational effect, the pull of the ice on the water. There's the elastic rebound effect of the land, and there's also rotational impacts, okay? You know, ice on Greenland or ice on Antarctica is ice near the pole. You know, as the ice melts and the water drains off, the rotation of the Earth tends to move that water towards the equatorial bulge, um, you know, raising sea level. So there's that effect as well. So there's lots of interactions there. And of course, if the AMOC reduces and shuts down, the equator gets warmer. So the intertropical convergence zone will shift southward. And this can cause large changes in seasonal precipitation on a local scale in the Amazon rainforest. The net effect is not clear. But uh, some regions will receive more rainfall than before, other regions less. On a seasonal level, Wet season precipitation in the Amazon rainforest will be diminished strongly if the AMOC collapses, whereas the dry season precipitation is significantly increased. Now, the vegetation there in the rainforest is adapted to this seasonal precipitation changes. So the veg when those things change completely, the vegetation regime can also change. And then you want to do the dynamic modeling to connect all of the elements okay so you do a bit of math here and this is showing the this is the changes um, uh, change in um, global mean temperature over the temperature limit okay when this factor when this ratio becomes one okay becomes greater than one then you can consider the 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 uh, tipping occurs 
and the temperatures are taken from the best available uh, literature on what temperatures, what the limits are to tip element, tip the element over. Okay, we've already probably passed it for Greenland, West Antarctic. Uh, we're very close. Amok and rainforest, Amazon rainforest. It says no, not yet. Um, but these elements are all coupled in this so-called fast slow system, which is a dynamical system, you know, modeled by the equations with slowly varying parameters, but fast changing states. Okay, and uh, so the modeling is done. And, uh, you know, some graphs are generated here showing, you know, t the change in global temperature and the tipping that occurs for different interaction strengths between the elements. You know, 1.6 degrees Celsius, you can get big problems occurring. We're getting very, very close to that. Um, and the, um, the, the links between them, the interaction links can, be, you know, the modeling, the strength between the interactions is also modeled. Okay, and uh, they use something called Monte Carlo sampling and propagation. So you run a whole bunch of models and uh, you vary the parameters. Um, there's random variation of the parameters or fluctuation, or if we, do, we, we just know a range, we don't know the actual value, then we, we uh, step through the, the, the whole range and we get an ensemble of, of uh, results. And basically, basically what we're getting here is, so here's the basic deal. When, when you have maximum interaction strength between the different elements, there's no tipping 39% of the time. And that doesn't really depend on the interaction uh, between the tipping elements. 61% of the time, as I said, uh, it tips. Now, if the interaction strength is strong, the strongest, it varies from zero to one. If it's one, um, only one element tips 22% of the time, 21% of the island of the time, two elements tip, and then three elements, 15%, and all four of them tip in 3% of the simulation runs. Now, when you decrease the strength of the interaction, the total percentage of tipping stays the same, interestingly, but in most cases, you know, when, when the interaction strength is very weak between the different tipping elements, then you only get one of them tipping 56% of the time. A second one goes 5% of the time, but that's it. There, there's three, you don't get cascading to three tipping or four tipping. So you get the idea. I mean, this is a very interesting, uh, you know, approach. And you can see, you know, this is the first cut using four of the main tipping elements, but you need to put the Arctic sea ice in, you need to put the methane and all the other tipping elements that you can think of and then model those using the same type of study to really figure out what's trying, what's, what's happening. And here is a key point for global warming up to two degrees Celsius, tipping occurs in 61% of all simulations, right? 22% uh, is in one element tips, two elements in 21% of the time, three and 15% and four and 3%. Okay, so that's the first uh, line of the, of the uh, table here. Okay, so that's the key point. And you can do other, you can generate other so images. So this is just critical temperatures for the different tipping elements. So you would want to expand this to all of the tipping elements in the system. And this is another way of looking at it. You know, when when the elements are all connected strongly, the tipping elements in the in the simulation at two degrees Celsius, 39% of the time there was no tipping. There was a 61%. And here's how the 61 is divided. You know, whether one a single element tips two, three, four, and so on. Okay, and uh, you know the the cascading connections between the different elements are looked at individually here. Okay, so those are the key factors in this paper. Again, I highly recommend that you download it and have a look at it. And I think this paper is uh, you know although it's got a lot of drawbacks, it doesn't consider enough tipping element points. The actual um, the actual way that it analyzes is interesting, you know, running the model ensemble. And it, I'd like to see this done for all of the tipping elements. Again, thank you for listening. Bye for now.